Hello, my friends. This is uh, Deepak Chopra, and I'm continuing our explorations with luminaries, uh, what I call a motley group of sages, scientists, philosophers, and psychotics. Um, so in that vein, today I have the great pleasure of speaking to my very dear friend, John Clifton, who is the son of a colleague and dear friend of mine for the last 30 years. Uh, that's uh, Jim Clifton, the CEO of uh, the Gallup organization. I'm sure you've heard of Gallup. And, <laughs> uh, there, there's no one in the world that hasn't heard of the Gallup organization. What they don't know, um, a lot of people associate Gallup only with political polls. What they don't know is that uh, Gallup has some of the most uh, um, up-to-date information on health and well-being and uh, the state of emotional uh, well-being as well across the world. And this data is so important that once you know the well-being of either a person or a family or a community or a business, or a country, or the world, then you can predict the future of that uh, of that entity. Uh, whether that future is going to be one where they're thriving, or one where they're going to be struggling, or one where they're going to be suffering or already are suffering. So John Clifton has uh, written a book, but I don't have the book right now. I have this big volume here, uh, which I printed out for the interview from the PDF sent to me. And when the book is out, we'll actually be doing follow-up interviews as well. So with that little introduction, John, thanks for joining me today. Deepak, thank you for having me. So first tell me um, why this book, why now, and why the title? You know, you have a very very um, compelling title. It says Blind Spot, The Global Rise of Unhappiness and How Leaders Missed It. Deepak, as you know, and it's something that you've helped us build, is for the past 15 to 16 years, we've been tracking how people's lives are going in almost every single country in the world. So we go out into the field and interview people and say, tell us how much stress you have. Tell us how much anger you have. Tell us uh, how much enjoyment you have. And the reason that we're doing this book now is because we found something in our data that has us really concerned. And the thing that has us so concerned is that when we look at stress, when we look at anger, when we look at physical pain, worry, and stress, all those indicators are rising really quickly. And it's got us deeply concerned. Um, and this book addresses the fact that there are so many leaders right now that are still wedded to traditional economic indicators. They follow things like unemployment. They follow things like GDP per capita. But what they aren't following is how people feel. And so they miss this global rise of unhappiness because they don't have any information on it. Well, this is very interesting because the last time I looked at uh, the data on happiness uh, more than more than several years ago. I thought that in general, uh, people were doing okay in um, terms of happiness. So what does your data show now? Our data show right now that when you look at those five factors, pain, anger, stress, sadness, and worry, that all of them with the exception of anger are up by about double digits. And that's very concerning to us. And it happened in the past 10 years. We came out with a global report on this, Deepak, and we sent it to the press, and it came out right when the pandemic was hitting. And there were a lot of people in the press, there were a lot of leaders that received the information. They said, why is this a surprise, Gal? Everybody knows that stress, that worry is skyrocketing because of the pandemic. And what we were most concerned about is if they felt like it was just the pandemic, then they were missing it because the rise of these negative emotions have been coming for a decade it wasn't just the pandemic alone. Uh, and so that's why we felt it was so important for us to get this information out. So John, now that you mentioned this, <clears throat> you know, we don't have a big organization like Gallup. Our foundation has a very small staff, but we were doing meta-analysis 
during the pandemic, looking at who's actually getting sick and who's not. And other scientific data that we have from the past uh, has suggested that less than 5% of chronic illness, less than 5% is genetically determined. So less than 5% of disease-related gene mutations are fully penetrant. The remaining 95 plus people who get sick have other factors. And then we continue to do our meta-analysis during the uh, pandemic when we found that the elderly who were getting sick or dying from the pandemic, they had chronic inflammation and they had chronic anxiety and they had chronic uh, depression. Sometimes the anxiety and depression and stress was, um, was uh, so low level or people are so used to chronic <laughs> stress, they didn't recognize that they were actually depressed or stressed. They thought this is how you feel normal. But we were able to create a link between inflammation, stress, and all the factors that you mentioned and getting sick from disease in the elderly. Then we looked at the younger people who were getting sick and who were dying actually, because not everybody who got COVID died, obviously. Mm -hmm. In the initial phase though, a lot of people died when you know with the, had the Delta variant. And we started to look at the younger people who were getting sick and dying, who were on respirators, et cetera. And they all had what are called cytokine storms, which means their body was flooded with inflammatory molecules. And that was directly connected to stress. So, you know, when people are stressed, they have uh, something called sympathetic overdrive. Their sympathetic nervous system goes crazy. And it's not just the fight flight response, it's also what we call feeling helpless. And feeling helpless, fight flight combination created inflammation and actually people were succumbing to disease. So even the pandemic actually was worsened in its morbidity and mortality through the factors that you mentioned. Those factors actually increased the virulence of the virus and the pandemic. And so we started to focus on what is what can we do on to alleviate that. And, you know, it turns out there's a part of our nervous system called the parasympathetic nervous system, which includes uh, a very important nerve in the body called the vagus nerve. And when the vagus nerve is activated, then that actually helps ameliorate the sympathetic overdrive. And that can be done through exercise, through yoga, through laughter, through chanting, through singing, through various other things like mind-body coordination, nutritional changes. Uh, and we realized that, you know, treating depression, anxiety above the head is not the only way because you have to treat the whole body. It includes things like sleep and, you know, uh, managing emotions, um, having emotional resilience, balancing your biological rhythms. And a whole new field has now surfaced called nutritional psychiatry. And where we now know that 80% of the serotonin uh, in our body comes from our gut and we're not even paying attention to what we eat. So there are many factors, but that's a whole nother um, you know, discussion which we should talk about. And I think Gallup would be very interested in that data as well. And we can explore that data together. But right now, I want to focus uh, uh, on what you know your very compelling chapters say. So here, chapter one: What economic models miss? Are, are we still using only economic models? I mean, I watched the news: stock market up, down. Biden has to go to Saudi Arabia to make peace with, uh, with uh, you know. Uh, people there, notwithstanding what happened in the past. Uh, at the same time, we have, you know, we need actually the cooperation of everyone, including so-called perceived enemies, because unless we all work together, there's not going to be any solution. But how we drive uh, fulfillment in a society or how we measure success in a society is what you're saying is wrong. So talk to me a little bit what economic models miss and 
what it means uh, unhappiness and elections we're watching it right now uh, as we watch the news well let me be clear because economic models and economics are fundamentally right what they are though is they should never be used to understand how people's lives are truly going um, and they should also never be used to understand how people feel um, and so I, I, other than that I, I completely agree but if you look back at key moments in history, take the Arab Spring, for example, uh, take a country like Egypt, who, of course, the imagery of Tahrir Square is something that many of us remember when it took place. Um, if you look back in history, GDP per capita was growing almost in a perfect linear fashion in the five years leading up to the Arab Spring. In fact, that trend is almost identical in Tunisia, where, of course, um, the Arab uprising uh, started. Of course, it was called the Jasmine Revolution uh, at the beginning when it started in Tunisia, uh, when Mohamed Bouazizi self-immolated uh, in Sidi Bouzed. So when you look at traditional economic indicators, it almost suggested that things are okay. In fact, even if you look at the Human Development Index, uh, it showed perfect progress in those two countries. Yet when you ask people how their lives were going, when it comes to uh, just rating their lives on a scale of zero to 10, it was crashing in both countries. Both were on roughly the global average at about 25 to 24% five years before the Arab Spring, and it dropped to around 11 to 14%, putting both countries on par with the Palestinian territories. So although economics may have been rising, how people saw how their lives were going was going in the opposite direction, and that's a concern. And Deepak, I'll give you one more example, because a lot of times people say, well, was that just an anomaly? Have you seen this anywhere else? Um, 2016 uh, uh, it was a big year, obviously, with the U.S. election, but another thing that happened around uh, the world was Brexit. In June 2016, um, Britons voted to leave the EU, and it was interesting because there were polls that took place beforehand. Lord Ashcroft, although he's a bit of a conservative pollster, if I remember correctly, he did a poll and he said, do you think it would be good for the economy if the U.K. leaves the EU? And a majority of Britons said, no, we don't think it'll be good for the economy. But a majority also said, but I think it'll be good for our lives. And when we went in and did our systematic tracking and asked people, how is your life going? In the two years leading up to Brexit, we saw one of the largest two-year crashes that we've ever seen in the history of our database uh, in terms of how people were saying that their lives were going. So not only did we see this massive decline that took place in Egypt, Tunisia, other countries like uh, Bahrain, uh, where there were massive protests during the Arab uprising, we also saw something similar in Brexit, uh, excuse me, in the lead up to the Brexit vote. That's very interesting, but I, you may or may not know this, but you know, when the Arab Spring uh, was happening, um, and I was very much part of the conversation with your dad. Um, yeah. And we had the data on what was happening in Libya. And actually, uh, Gallup more or less predicted that Libya was going to fall based on the well-being indices. And as a result of that, I had uh, Gaddafi's son in my class uh, on leadership at, uh, at Kellogg uh, Northwestern University. Uh, and uh, he was a very articulate a young man who spoke about being an investor and his hobbies and one of the most intelligent people in my class. And then, uh, you know, I got a call, but I suppose I can reveal this now, or maybe I can't, but I am. I got a call from our government that I should go to Libya uh, to see, you know, uh, what we can do. Um, I think your dad and I had a conversation about that. And then three weeks after my class, Libya was gone as we knew it. The kid in my class, young man, was dead. So was his father. So, you know, it was so predictive. The, your data from Gallup was so predictive that uh, uh, it shocked me, even though I was part of that collaboration. And it did not result in a change in our foreign policy or whatever we do, uh, or what we're doing right now, you know, with what's happening across the world, with China and this Russia and uh, Ukraine. But let me um, move ahead with this now. Um, the happiest people in the world, who are they? <laughs> yeah, this is a great question because a lot of people are curious about how do you measure happiness? 
Um, and most people, what they're familiar with when they talk about happiness, and I often ask people, have you heard of who the happiest country in the world is? And they often get it right. They say back to me, it's Denmark or one of the Nordic countries. Um, and the data behind that is Gallup's. And it's popularized by a group called SDSN, which Jeff Sachs and John Helliwell uh, run out of the United Nations. And they use Gallup's data. And all we do is we ask people to rate their lives on a scale of zero to 10, where zero is the worst possible life and 10 is the best possible life. Where do you stand today? And then we average the answers and the countries who average the highest rating are crowned the happiest country in the world. Um, now, the reason this gets confusing and why I wanted to make uh, this point in this book is because that's not the only way to measure happiness. In fact, if you read some of the versions of the World Happiness Report, and I believe this is in the 2011 version, um, they go through and they say, what we're measuring in terms of rating your life on zero to 10 may not actually be happiness. Uh, and they said, in fact, it's probably more accurate to say that we're uh, measuring contentment. And I agree with that. Um, and so what you're probably seeing is Danes, uh, Norwegians are probably the most content in life, not necessarily that they are experiencing the most happiness. So there's another element which we measure, which is to ask people directly, did you laugh and smile a lot all day yesterday? Did you experience a lot of enjoyment? If you look at the countries who rank the best in terms of those metrics, they're not necessarily the Nordic countries. They're Latin American countries. In fact, Paraguay, Panama, El Salvador have been some of the countries that rank at the top of the list. And even despite some of their economic troubles, uh, people in Latin America know how to have fun. And we have proven it statistically year in and year out. Now, the last piece on that is so we measure how people see their lives. This is a measure of contentment. We measure how people live their lives. These are positive affect type questions. And then we also ask, this negative affect. And it's what I've referred to as unhappiness. That's where we measure about how much anger, how much stress they feel, or how much sadness. The region of the world that has always felt and reported openly the most negative emotions for, since the history of our tracking has always been the Middle East. And in fact, the highest number we've ever recorded on the average of our five metrics was Afghanistan right when the American forces were pulling out. We were doing face-to-face -face interviews at that time, the Taliban even allowed our uh, female interviewers to interview women across the country. And we saw the worst negative emotions we've ever seen in the history of our database. And I'll say one last piece, which is when you hear that people throughout Latin America report the most negative, or excuse me, the highest positive emotions, this is something that's so fascinating. They're number two in the world when it comes to negative emotions. So people throughout Latin America are number one when it comes to positive emotions, but they are also very high when it comes to negative emotions. They're probably the most expressive people throughout the world. So let me ask you a couple of questions related to that, because you know, I've recently I've been traveling a lot in the Middle East, and uh, also there was all this hype about Bhutan. So tell me about Bhutan, number one. Yeah. Uh, and then on the Middle East right now, actually, what I sense is a, a amazing shift. You know, I was just in Dubai. There were 22-year-old woman who's the Minister for Happiness for the government of Dubai. Uh, there's amazing reforms happening in the Emirates. And actually, I was recently also involved in a reconciliation between the Islamic world and uh, the Vatican, where they're making peace on every level and including economic partnerships now with Israel in, in the Middle East. So something dramatic is happening in at least that part of the Middle East, uh, the Emirates. Uh, can you comment on both Bhutan and the Middle East? Yeah. And, you know, Deepak, it's, uh, I appreciate you asking that because, you know, oftentimes when people say the Middle East, I think it's, you know, tough to paint a broad brush from uh, Afghanistan to Iraq to the GCC to Egypt and you know all the way to Morocco and our data confirmed that the realities are very very different so the GCC um, all six of those countries people there rate their lives very high in fact in the UAE people rate their lives uh, among the highest in the world if I remember correctly I believe it was in the top 20 um, in the United States, if I believe uh, when I saw it last time, the United um, States also people rate Emirates was ahead of the United States in terms of 
Um, that, yeah, I don't remember in our 2020, uh, 2021 data, but that very well may be the case. Okay. Um, but as in countries like Egypt, uh, where people are rating their lives very lowly, um, and a lot of that has to do with when people rate their lives, it highly correlates with income. So the wealthier the country, the higher people tend to rate their lives. And that's why there's data on emotions, on whether or not people laugh and smile a lot, or whether or not they experience enjoyment or anger or physical pain. I think those are some of the most uh, interesting and important data because you see so many differences. In a place like Egypt, not only do people rate their lives low, they also experience a lot of anger and sadness. Um, so I think those are some really fascinating uh, insights that should be helpful to leaders. Behavioral economics and measuring a great life. Um, this term is becoming almost part of our vocabulary. What is behavioral economics? Behavioral economics is really the science of uh, decision making and understanding why people make the decisions that they make. Uh, years ago, economists sort of said that we are all rational actors or automatons. We're basically robots trying to figure out if we um, you know, get the greatest utility from every decision that we make. And psychologists, including Danny Kahneman, started getting involved because he's an economist and he's a psychologist. And he said, well, that's not actually the case. In fact, a lot of times people make uh, not necessarily rational decisions, but they make emotional decisions. Um, it affects their cognitive uh, abilities or decision making. Um, it, it affects virtually everything. Um, and so this has created a lot of government initiatives. A lot of people are familiar with the airport study where uh, they would reduce spillage in the men's bathroom by putting a picture of a fly in a urinal that would cause uh, spillage to reduce by a significant amount. Um, but why would putting a picture of a fly in a urinal cause behavior to change and reduce spillage on the floors of airports? Um, but it did, and it's because human beings are not necessarily rational actors, we are emotional actors. And with our research with you, we've determined that 70% of all the decisions that we make as human beings are not rational, they are emotional. Um, and that affects virtually everything. And in fact, it's influenced much of our research in the workplace. So uh, sometimes a little known fact, uh, although we work with a few thousand organizations, um, we do behavioral research on how emotionally attached uh, employees are to the organization that they work with, because people can go through the exact same training in life. But what is it that causes somebody to contribute just a little bit more? Why do they work just one hour more or care, put a little bit more care in the work product that they're doing? And that's a concept called uh, employee engagement. And we've been quantifying it for a really long time. Um, and we find that if uh, executives manage to this, they actually find that they will see higher customer scores, uh, higher returns on profit. So it's a really good thing, not just uh, for the health and well-being of employees. It's also something that affects the bottom line. This is very revealing because, you know, biologically speaking, it's obvious that our emotional brain is uh, 100 million years old. Our intellectual brain is only 4 million years old. And uh, rationality as so what we call rationality and rational thinking uh, and, you know, exploded with the development of language skills. So once we started to tell stories, our uh, intellectual brain grew very fast. But again, when it comes, so, uh, you know, rationality as we use it, logical thinking, empirical facts, this is very recent. It's like a few thousand years um, in our evolution, maybe five, six thousand years in our evolution, compared to the hundred million years of um, emotional uh, evolution. And reptilian is even longer, 300 million years. So we all make emotional decisions. We all make instinctive decisions. And then we justify them with so-called rational thought. So yeah. this is very compelling um, information. Uh, what are the five elements of a great life? Well, before I get to that, if you don't mind, Deepak, you mentioned stories. So I just want to give one quick story that kind of... Please. Uh, talks about this sort of emotional or irrational behavior, but um, an executive that you and I are both close to once walked into a Barnes and Noble 
And he wanted to buy a book. He wanted to buy the US News and World rankings on schools. And so he walks up to the front desk and there's a woman that's standing there. And he said, excuse me, could you help me please? And she's on the phone. So she holds her hand up like this, like, give me a second. And she goes back to her phone call and the phone call isn't about work. It's something in her personal life. And it's not necessarily uh, something that's an emergency. She's just talking to a friend, but she has paused this customer who would like to buy something so that she can continue on because she doesn't care. And so he says, if you don't mind, can you just, do you have this book? And she goes, we don't have it. And so he starts to leave. So he, walk, he walks toward the exit and a young man looks at him and he goes, sir, uh, can I help you? And he said, well, I actually wanted to buy this book and apparently you don't have it. And he goes, no, we have it. He said, but why do you want to buy it? And he said, well, I want to understand the rankings of schools. And he goes, do you know we have another book on that? He ended up buying three books, two books he didn't even intend to buy. The interaction that he had with one, the first individual meant he was going to spend zero dollars. And that day he spent over a hundred dollars just because of the engagement of that one particular individual. That is human behavior at its finest. Both of them received exactly the same rational training. Both of them received exactly the same pay. But behaviorally, they acted totally differently in the presence of a customer. One turned them down. The other one upsold them by 3x. That's the power of human behavior that's happening within the workplace. And now what Gallup has pivoted to is trying to figure out these macro level behaviors to understand how to better drive outcomes for societies and countries. Don, you just reminded me of something that happened about 15 years ago when I was in Australia. And there was a very, you know, with all these new phone companies coming on board, you know, in the United States, we have so many Spectrum, this, that, the other, AT&T, same thing was happening in Australia. So people, there was a very high churn rate of people switching from one phone company to another. But there was this one company when people, customers called to switch to another company, they would engage with whoever was on the other line on a personal basis. So how's your day going? Uh, oh, I'm taking my dog to the vet, et cetera. Let me know what happens. You know, what did the vet say about the dog? And as a result of that conversation, the churn rate went down very dramatically. People didn't mind paying a little extra money as long as they had a good relationship with the customer department. So very yeah. good point that you make. Okay, so what are the five elements of a great life? Okay, so the five elements of a great life. First is what we call work well-being. That's just the emotional attachment that you have to the work that you do every single day. The next one is financial well-being. How do you feel about your own finances? The next one is community well-being. How do you feel about the attachment to the community, the area around you? The next one is physical well-being. And the fifth one is social well-being, the relationship that you have to your friends and family. So we found in a number of studies that these are massive drivers of a great life. Um, we found it here in the United States. We found it in 150 different countries. Um, but we're not the only organization to find that. So Pew actually did a very similar study. Um, they did it in, uh, I think it was 20 some different countries. And they just openly asked people, what is it you want? Uh, what do you believe makes a great life? And they found something almost identical to what we did. So those five drivers tend to show up in many aspects of research. But there's another part that's also fascinating, which is just because those five things explain what we believe about 50% of how people talk about their stress, their sadness, there's another 50% that's just totally unexplained. Now, you touched on some of this earlier um, about sometimes people are just born with a certain um, kind of uh, a set of emotions. And some people actually call this the hedonic treadmill, where we're always kind of running in place all at the same time. Um, where if I believe that my life is a seven, if something bad happens to me, I'll eventually come back to the seven that I was previously. Or um, if I'm an eight and I win the lottery, uh, you think that my life is going to be a 10. It's actually not. I come back to the eight just about a year later. There has been some research that's found that uh, some different findings to that, which is the hedonic treadmill, if something horrible happens, the loss of a loved one, uh, if you're horribly injured, that you actually don't rebound to where you were. Uh, so it doesn't mean that that's necessarily perfect. And one of the things that I included in the book that if we are just born with a preset sort of um, 
view on life, then why is it so different around the world? Why is it when you ask somebody who lives in Afghanistan, rate your life on a scale of zero to 10, they say their life is a two. And why is it when someone, if you ask them in Denmark, how's your life going? They say, my life is an eight or a nine. And I think that has a lot to do with what's happening in those communities, what's happening in those countries. Um, and obviously with Afghanistan, we saw a record high of stress, sadness, uh, physical pain, anger, and worry. Um, and again, I think many of us don't, we don't really need a huge analysis to fully understand uh, what's going on there that's driving that because uh, so much, so many bad things are just facing Afghanistan right now. Um, so anyway, that's kind of a long-winded way to say. No, that's that. very interesting, but I, you bring up very important points. You know, we've been working independently uh, also with uh, you know his holiness uh, the dalai lama and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of social science around what is called the happiness equation and uh, 50% of our happiness is determined by, by something called the set point in the brain mm -hmm. and unhappy people are always uh, in a mood where they are either criticizing condemning complaining or playing the victim the happier people, on the other hand, um, are looking for opportunities and always engaged in um, social interaction with attention, affection, appreciation, gratitude, and acceptance. Now, so we started saying, how does this happen? How does this uh, mm -hmm. set point in the brain get created? And uh, it suggested that it happens um, in the first five, six years of life, depending on your parents. So if your parents and your immediate emotional engagement with your peers and parents, siblings, is where you constantly hear criticism, condemn, condemnation, and uh, yeah. complaints, then that's what you get as an adult. Uh, and most people, sometimes uh, their emotional development freezes at about eight years of age, particularly in males, which is not bad if you want to run for president, but it is definitely a, a major problem for the world because the world leaders we see right now are you know, not really emotionally intelligent, if I may say so. They are all, it doesn't matter where you look in the world. Uh, you, you see this anger in the leaders this tribal tendency in the leaders, uh, this, uh, they are kind of also uh, create that in their constituencies by complaining and with hostility and making the other side wrong. So that's, it's complicated. You, as you know, this whole issue of happiness is contentment and fulfillment is pretty complicated. But with this kind of research, there's definitely a lot of new insights that we're gleaning into this complicated way that humans behave. We are full of paradox, we're full of contradiction, and sometimes of ambiguity, which may be a good thing in certain ways, because if you accept ambiguity, uh, there is some creative impulse that starts to come through. When you stop being right about everything that you think you're right about, you're actually mostly wrong about. I'm just reading a book right now um, on being certain, believing you are right even when you're not. So it's a very interesting book. Uh, all the information you have actually precludes you from uh, and create something called cognitive and perceptual uh, constraints to your deeper knowing. But I was in the, you know, I was also looking at the data on your data, our data on community well being from a long time ago. And uh, it suggested that one of the questions was, do you feel safe walking alone at night? The other was, uh, if you lose something, do you think it'll return to you? So, again, because I've been going to the Emirates at that Gulf states recently. I lost my wallet, which also had my phone in it. And so I, you know, I was kind of, when I got back to my rest, uh, my hotel, I told my host, I said, you know, I've lost my phone, my wallet, there's money in it, there's credit cards and the phone. Now, what do I do? He said, don't worry. There's never been um, uh, an item lost that's not returned. And sure enough, in three hours, uh, this came back to my hotel. 
um, then, you know, I was also in a shopping mall during lunchtime. The shops were open and some of the people who shop owners had gone for lunch. Of course, there are lots of cameras and surveillance, but the shops are open. And so I asked my host again, how come people don't even lock up the stores? He said, because first there's surveillance. Uh, secondly, it's not part of our culture right now. And so, you know, you say, is it because of Sharia law, etc.? And then you realize that, you know, last time, <laughs> when was the last time that Sharia law was actually executed? This is something very dramatic happening in these uh, in these states. Well, you bring up a really good point because the item, do you feel safe walking alone at night? Um, I believe the United Nations for the uh, SDGs are actually considering making that one a, an official indicator, which we're right. really proud of. And I know you helped us uh, right. think through the integration of that. But the reason we included it <clears throat> is because when we would approach world leaders and say, what do you want to, uh, or excuse me, not necessarily world leaders, but some of the best experts on crime. And we would say, what is it that leaders should be watching more? And they said, we believe what they should be watching is not just if people are safe, but if people feel safe, because there's a difference. And that's why we wanted to capture this really important item. You are right that the UAE, when we ask people, do you feel safe walking alone at night, men and women, they say overwhelmingly yes. Uh, and it is ranked one of the highest countries in the world for that particular indicator. It's also true in places like Singapore. It's also true in places like Qatar. Um, but people feel safe in those particular communities. And they don't in Venezuela. They don't in Afghanistan. They're very open about the fact that they don't feel safe walking around at night. In fact, that indicator outside of um, economic opportunities, that indicator is the single widest gap between men and women. Women just don't feel as safe as men uh, within their societies as men do. And it's something that I think the world should you know, work on as much as they can in order to close that gap because women should feel uh, able to feel safe walking alone at night in any single one of their particular communities. Um, so that item has worked incredibly well. And that is one of the foundational elements of creating a great community is whether or not people feel safe. My very special guest today um, is John Clifton. Is the author of this amazing book, which will be soon <laughs> released, <laughs> Blind Spot, The Global Rise of Unhappiness and How Leaders Missed It. And this, um, all the data here is from Gallup. Uh, I've been a senior scientist with Gallup for several decades now. And I'm very proud of you, John, for having put this uh, together. As I read through your chapters, I'm uh, now... Um, feeling that we need to do a series of conversations. These conversations that we are having right now, they go on social media, ultimately reach about 25 million people. But for various uh, reasons, we cannot go over 45 minutes. So what I'm suggesting right now, uh, we can't go 45 minutes to put it all over the social media reach the 25 million people that we want to. So I just want to read some of the chapter headings, and then I want to suggest that we actually uh, go like we've been doing uh, and do a series. Uh, when is the book officially out? September 13th. Okay, so in the near future, maybe on the when the book is being published, we do a second installment. But I suggest that we actually do a series where we address each chapter. I think um, that'd be fantastic. The we've done, uh, uh, in the way we've done this morning. I just want to read some of the other chapter headings. Does money buy happiness? The global great jobs crisis? The world's broken communities? The global hunger crisis? A lonely planet? The serious outcomes of unhappiness? Uh, how are women's lives going? The emotional, emotionless society. A letter to Rwandan President Paul Kagame. How the global pandemic shaped happiness. Uh, what public sector leaders can do. What private sector leaders can do. Uh, what private sector and public uh, sector leaders can do together. 
And then it concludes with something called five million conversations. It's the most thorough, the most exhaustive, the best data I have seen. And uh, I'm really proud to be associated with you and your father and your amazing organization. I've visited uh, uh, your offices everywhere, New York, Washington, Nebraska. And uh, I just have to say, that this is the best service um, one can offer to the world. So congratulations and really, really proud of the work you're doing and to be continued. Amen. And Deepak, thank you. We at Gallup consider you family. Uh, and thank you for all the advice that you've given us and the help you've given us in building the Gallup World Bowl. Um, because without you, I don't think it would be possible for us to be asking the questions that we're asking, coming up with the insights that we're coming. So thank you for your partnership on all Well, that. thanks, John. But, you know, social science is saying when you have shared vision, when you have maximum diversity, when you leverage each other's strengths, something that you guys created, or we, you know, strength finders goes directly back to the family. When you have shared vision, diversity, leveraging each other's strengths, emotional and spiritual bonding, there's no problem that can't be solved. And I'm going to hold us up to that standard, you and our partnership and our family. Amen. And if I remember correctly, Deepak, your number one strength is strategic. Uh, because last time you and I were together, I think it was in your home, you told me about how you've used strategic to be so successful throughout your career. Yeah. And my <laughs> other strengths are futuristic, adaptable, maximizer, and convener. So thanks to you guys, I know exactly where I stand and who to work with to complement my strengths. Thank you, John. Mm -hmm.